Hey guys, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is the daily show where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California, and we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Our panel is so lovely today because Clark uh, Wolf uh, is with uh, us. Hey. So hey. Nice, Natasha. We never get to do the show together, so I'm so happy. I no, it's been a minute. I okay, know. my leather jacket twin, Jeremy John. Oh, thank you very much, Natasha. And it's uh, Natasha, and it's a happy Thursday. <laughs> Friday, happy days, Saturday, <laughs> one all day. All day. He's been singing it. <laughs> been singing it all week. And rounding off our panel, Christian Harlow. A lot of happiness. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, listen, guys, before uh, we get started, and I, I can't even believe uh, when I heard this yesterday, uh, one of entertainment's uh, true... Uh, Titans uh, passed away. Uh, Mary Tyler Moore uh, passed away, which uh, was just, I mean, it's insane to think about that of a world without Mary Tyler Moore. She kind of revolutionized the way sitcoms were even viewed and understood. Uh, her performance in Ordinary People is like one of the all time greats. Um, and we lost just one of the most, uh, you know, brilliant lights uh, in the industry. And uh, I just thought before we got started with the show, we should mention that uh, she will be missed. Mary Tyler Moore, what a treasure she's been to the world of entertainment for so long. And uh, the world of entertainment is lesser for her loss. All right, with that said, let's get on with today's show. DC and Warner Brothers are going back to the drawing board with their Flash movie. Variety has learned that Warner Brothers has tapped writer Joby Harrell to do a page one rewrite of the Flash script. The movie has been on hold ever since it lost its director, Rick Famayua, so Warner's decided that while it waits to find a replacement, the studio will take the script in a different direction. That direction remains to be seen, as does whether or not it will make its release date that is currently set for June 27th, 2018. John, will the Flash ever hit its release date now that it is getting a page one rewrite? Uh, to channel the inner Vince McMahon, no chance in hell. Uh, this, uh, it's yet another violinist going up to the deck of the Titanic to play as it sinks. Um, <laughs> it's... Like, I, I almost feel like at this point when we mention DC, we should follow with da 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 <laughs> Um, oh, it's it, look, three directors they've been through now, three scripts, and now a little over a year away from their proposed release date, they said, yeah, uh, this, this isn't just script doctoring. This is a page one read. That means yeah. they've thrown it out. They've thrown it out, and they're starting again. Um, and look, for any one particular project, you go, oh, okay. I mean, look, they're, they're not happy with what they got. It is better than... To, if you're not happy with what you got, it is better to scrap it, start it again, and make sure you get it right. Absolutely is. But this is daily life now yeah. from Warner Brothers in DC. Everything is about, we're doing this. Oh, no, turns out that was a sack of shit. Now we're going to do this. Nope, we didn't like that. And we got this director. No, now we got rid of him. Now we got this director. Oh, he left because we're, he didn't like us. And now we got this director. Now he's gone. We got this script. Oh, now this guy did a rewrite. Oh, now we're throwing that script out. And this is turning into the Ringling Brothers' big comeback because it's a circus. Um, the, it's just ridiculous. And, you know, before you get too tempted to say, you know, why are you, you trashing on DC and stuff like that? I get frustrated because I am a big fan of the yeah. DC properties. And it's when you're a fan, like, if the Toronto Maple Leafs, for a sports analogy, if they're losing, you don't care because you don't love the Maple Leafs. If you love the Maple Leafs, you care and you get angry. And, and I, somebody who thinks Man of Steel is a masterpiece of a film, uh, and, you know, I'm a defender of Justice League and Suicide Squad, but they clearly divided the audiences and they were not as good as they should have been. Uh, I just get frustrated because you hear from Marvel, right? Marvel, I keep hearing people say this too, well, Marvel had that whole Edgar Wright thing. Yes, but that was way in advance. And everyone was still saying how much that there was going to be problems, though, with it too. But yeah. because they had a ship, I guess, that was already, I guess, not hitting an iceberg and sinking, as you said <laughs> before, it, it's easier to push the blame towards DC right now. No, absolutely. The thing is, this isn't a movie in, movie out like clockwork occurrence with the Marvel films. Every once in a while, oh, we've pushed this one release date three months, or we've, we've done this, or we, once in a while. But it feels like every single DC project, 
And as somebody who's a fan of DC, I'm getting really, I mean, you guys already know I'm getting really frustrated with it, but I'm, I am completely frustrated with it at this point. Three directors, three scripts, back to page one when we're a year and a bit away from the release date. I, I don't know. What do you think, Christian? Well, first, hey, hey Adam, can you bring that picture up again? Um, I didn't know that both uh, Liev Schreiber and Jonathan Voiko had a kid. <laughs> uh, look, look, look at that picture. Um, but what, what I will say about this particular... I agree with you, man. It's, it's, it, it, the sports analogy is, is the best because it's like when in the 90s, the Yankees were crappy. They had Steve Sachs and Jesse Barfield, and it was just, and I'm like, come on, guys, get, get it together. And they, and because they had the resources to do it, they had the money to do it. They just couldn't put the team together. And then 96 rolled around and, and it started to work out okay. But we're not talking about this season. Um, but this is how I feel about DC. It's the same thing. It's like, you have the material. You have some of the great. You your villains are far superior than to Marvel's villains. Any, yeah. Anything Marvel Marvel's has, villains. your villains are the Way best. Better. There's so many more characters. That have so much history. Honestly, the stories in the DC universe. I enjoy way more than I like Marvel. They just can't figure out how to do it. So it's one of these things to where, and I, I don't, I don't know. You assume and you speculate that there's too many cooks in the kitchen. They're getting rid of people. The, the higher up, Silverman left, and then people are leaving left and right. Screenwriters are leaving. Directors are leaving. Composers are leaving. Everybody's leaving because they don't know what they're doing. It's just a slop house mess. So it's. They need one person. They need to bring in that one, that Joe Torrey, if you will. They need to bring in that person, the Kevin Feige, and they've got to get it together. And don't announce stuff like this. Don't announce that you're going to do, we're doing a Flash movie. Don't announce it until it's happening. Right. They announced that, you know, the Black Adam thing like years ago. And then they finally said, oh, now, now it'll probably happen. Shut up until you're right about to start filming. This is, this is why this is a bad thing to s announce things before you're ready to start going when it's not a, a, a piece of unit. And you know, the other frustrating thing is you can say, okay, well, if you have this natural disadvantage and you have this natural disadvantage, I'm sorry, and I know a lot of Marvel fans are going to scream at their monitors right now when I say this. DC has the greatest superheroes. You have Batman and you have Superman, and they are the two all-time best superheroes ever. All right. Then you got a third member of that trinity, by the way, in Wonder Woman, who's got a film coming out that all of us are just dying to see. Um, it, that's the trailer that won Comic Con to me was that Wonder Woman trailer. I think it looks fantastic. They got a great director on board. You have all the money in the world. You have access to the greatest talent in the world. You have every advantage, every single advantage. Best source material, amazing finances behind you. Big distribution network, amazing filmmaking talent at your disposal. There's no excuse, none. And all I can do, and all any of us can do as DC fans, is just wait with bated breath for that Wonder Woman movie to come out. And it's like the Yankees. Yeah. All is dim and dark until they crack one out of the park. One championship If they can do around. that with Wonder Woman, everything will feel better. There's another great sports analogy. It says, you know, when teams have all these problems, it's just because they're winning, they're losing. I mean, like, there's, there's locker room drama. People hate each other. But there's a great sports crow that says this, winning cures everything. Yep. Wonder Woman comes out, crushes it, everything will feel a lot better. But right now it feels kind of bleak. I don't know, Jeremy, how do you see all this? <laughs> well, I have no sports analogies. I just have analogies of family, life, and broken hopes and dreams. I want to be <laughs> supportive of DC because, like you said, I'm a huge fan of DC property. I have a bunch of DC comic books. I've read them. I love the characters. It's it's very it's great material from a very competent studio. I don't know what's happening almost, over there. It, Warner Brothers consistently cranks out great right. films. So, yeah, and so then they stumble when it comes to DC. It's, it's like we're going upside down math. A positive and a positive equals a negative. I don't get what's happening over there right now. <laughs> it's like I want to be supportive, and I want to. It, it's kind of like if 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 a parent has a kid who starts making bad decisions, so you forgive these bad decisions as they go. But at a point when your kid has come at you week at uh, upon week upon week, like I was saying before we we started airing, I was like, this is getting absurd at this point. You know, like mm. it's just every other week something crazy happens and something's getting rewritten or something's scrapped or something's getting turned on its head. It's like if your kid comes at you, and it's like. Um, I dropped out of school and blew my inheritance on black tar heroin and unprotected <laughs> sex. I, you, you have to be like, 
I can't support that. <laughs> I, I, I no longer can support your life decisions. And it this sounds more like a play on New York. Story uh, of yours. John, <laughs> uh, John, we had a pact. You weren't supposed to say that on air. Uh, but it's getting to the point where when people online are like, why do you like, it's like, yeah, I, I do have to make excuses as to why I'm, I'm still looking forward to DC movies. But it's because it's like the logic part of my brain gets turned off for the fanboy hope. It's like, I hope they do well because I want to see them do well. But stories like this just, they kick me, man. They kick me right where it hurts. Clark, you're hearing all this kind of stuff. What's your reaction? I'm taking it all in. <laughs> taking it all in. No, look, I think honestly, my reaction is slow down. I, I'm glad they're doing a page one rewrite. Do it. Take your time. Uh, to me, the biggest problems happened when, you know, after Man of Steel, uh, untitled Superman follow-up movie turned into Batman v Superman because we got to introduce Justice League and Justice League is cut. It's putting the cart before the horse. Take your time, guys. Like all of you have said, we love these characters. These are smart, awesome, cool characters that already have this built-in fan base. So take your time. We're going to be there by the time the movie comes out. It's not like we're going to go, oh, well, I almost said a bad word, but it's not like we're going to say forget <laughs> Superman. Like he's not, you know, I'm not interested. Of course we're always going to be interested. And the other thing that I think is really interesting is that The Flash is telling a very compelling story on television. Mm -hmm. So why yeah. can't they figure out how to do it in a movie? Um, you know, so take your time, guys. Slow down and 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 do the page one rewrites. Get it right. Don't get it out fast. And I think you raise a great point. Well, two great points, really. It is, as a DC fan, even more concerning when you step back and see why do you seem to have this figured out on TV <laughs> and yet struggle? But the other thing is, is this too, I think this is where the real core of it is, and I think Clark just kind of uncovered it a bit, is that it's not so much that they're going back and doing a page one rewrite. Uh, because like we said, like I said before, get it, do the right thing. If, if it's a bad script, don't go ahead and make a bad script. It's what it means that once again they have to go back and do a page one rewrite. It's not so much anger at the current situation. It's as a fan being upset that, well, this just points to the fact you've been making mistake after mistake before. Why have we come to this point? Why has it gotten to this point that you didn't just wait until you had the right script in the first place and then go, now that we have our script, now let's cast our guy, now let's set a release date, now let's get a director who's going to be here for more than six minutes, and then move ahead and make the picture. I mean, so, I, I don't know. Like, at this point, Let's, let's go hypothetical here, because I believe Wonder Woman is going to be a really good film. I have a lot of trust in Patty Jenkins. I like the, the, everything we've seen. They seem to be getting the right tone from what we've seen in the trailers. I believe it's going to be really good. I do. That's what I believe. But let me ask the hypothetical. Let's say Wonder Woman comes out, and best case, it's, it's as divisive as Suicide Squad and, and Justice League was. Worst case, it's just not a good film. Do you think, and, and Christian, I'll start with you, do you think diehard DC fans may at that point start to lose their faith in the movie franchise? Maybe, but I just got this image when you said that because I think Patty Jenkins is going to try her damnness to make this thing awesome. I got this image that the studio executives at, at Warner Brothers right now are the minions. And, 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 and like, they're just running around. They don't know what to do. And they're telling Patty Jenkins, she's like, wait, you want me to do what? And it's like, I feel that's what happened to David Ayer. I feel like that's even what happened with Zack Snyder. I feel like there's just minions running around making these bad decisions. So the question is, well, I don't know. It, because I, here's the thing. The, the thing was with the diehard DC fans. They don't think that... Suicide Squad had a problem. They don't Great think point. Batman v Superman had a problem. So to them, they're they're doing it right. Yeah, so there's a lot of the hardcores, but there are that those the other side of the fan that maybe right on the fence that they might say, "Okay, guys, I, I I've been there with you." What can we do to fix this? Clark, what do you think the response would be? Uh, you know, look, the numbers don't lie. I know that sounds like, I, I just feel like, uh, I, I think that the, the, like you said, Christian, the diehard fans who, who you're right, they don't have a problem with what Warner Brothers has been putting out. So I don't think that there's going to be anything that will turn them off, mm. and, and that's totally fine. But I think, you know, I these, like I said, the numbers don't lie. If Wonder Woman comes out, if it is div divisive and people don't show up, Warner Brothers, I think, needs to take a real good, hard look at what they have in front of them and go, okay, maybe we do one at a time right now. Maybe we're not going to do this plate spinning. We've got Justice League in production. We've got Aquaman in production. Let's see. Let's just 
cool out a little bit. And I also think they should give Berlanti a crack at this. I just got this. I got this image of a minion going to the bank. Like, oh, billion right. dollar check? Yeah, we'll exactly. catch that. You know, exactly. So now you're like, how'd yeah. that happen? Batman hat on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's next? All this talk of minions is making me so happy right now. <laughs> okay, The Hollywood Reporter reports that Naomi Harris, a recent Oscar nominee for supporting actress in Moonlight, has signed on to star alongside Dwayne Johnson in Rampage, <laughs> New Line Cinema's adventure Amazing. film based on the 1980s video game of the same name. The movie, about a transformed gorilla, crocodile, and wolf wreaking havoc in North America, will feature Johnson as an animal-loving hero who is the world's only hope in stopping the destruction. Harris sparked to the fun tone of the script and decided to star opposite The Rock as a geneticist with a moral streak. Rampage is set to release in theaters on April 20th, 2018. Clark, thoughts on Naomi Harris joining The Rock in Rampage the movie? I, well, as and I have to say, Ray, great job with that graphic. <laughs> we're all sitting here giggling our, our faces off at this. Um, I, love, I love this for Naomi Harris. Uh, the first time I became aware of her was in 28 Days Later. And mm. she is a badass. She's a great action star. She's an incredible actress. Um, she, has, she was super fun in the Pirates movies. So I like seeing her in a big franchise. And, and I think putting her opposite uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson would be a lot of fun, especially considering this premise. So I'm all for it. Jeremy? This is absurd. I didn't even know they were making a Rampage movie. They're I know. Like, we were sitting yeah. around the pre-production meeting. We are talking about this. You just, wait, wait. Th they're making a Rampage I know, I was like, movie? I was like, there's only one Rampage I know, and that's the game that took me about five hours to beat because there were no saves, but I got through it. I went around the entire United States, beat down every building. Uh, this is great for her. In the end, I have to pull back and go, wait a minute. I saw Assassin's Creed and every other video game movie beforehand. I hope it's good, but it is a video game movie, and so far, they if there's one thing that can uh, that has a worse track record in the eyes of everybody than, than DC movies right now, it's video game movies. So I hope it works out for her. I hope the movie's good, but we'll see what happens. Uh, you know what? If they go for the same feel that they did with San Andreas, which is a yeah. ridiculous, nonsensical movie in every aspect, but was kind of fun to watch. They do that. Makes it, this is actually a good move for her, too, because, look, you're going to get... She's got a great spotlight on her right now because of Moonlight, right? Go get that paycheck movie. Yeah. Go do that. Right. Go uh, get a high pro. You star lying side of the rock now. You're gonna have more eyeballs because not. Let, let's face it. No matter how good Moonlight was, not a ton of people saw it. You star alongside the rock. A lot of people are gonna know who you are now. It's a great career move. And I know she's saying she read the script and loved it. Just once, I would love to hear an actor who just got cast in movies saying. Yeah, I looked at the script and it was kind of crappy, but but, uh, but I think maybe it can work out anyway. I would <laughs> yeah. love to hear one actor once say I read the script and it wasn't any good. When's this movie coming out? Is this a next year, right? Is yeah, April twentieth, yeah, twenty eighteen. So hey, this one. All right, so we're not going to have Godzilla versus King Kong yet, but we're going to have the GoBots Godzilla and King Kong in Rampage, <laughs> and I can look forward to that enough. Christian, I think it's a really smart move, and first to address the the video game thing. The difference yeah. I think with Assassin's Creed and these other movies, especially Assassin's Creed, is pretty like it's a complex story as far as how you figure all that out and decide whether or not, which I think was the bad move, to spend too much time in the modern day and not enough time in the past. Um, there's just so much to do there. This is just a stupid monster movie, which you can have a lot of fun with. You don't have to worry about too much. Like John was saying with San Andreas, you just there's people aren't going to be like, well, that's not what it was like in the video game. All you got to do is have monkey smash windows and a lizard burn something. And then, okay, you're being true to the video game. As far as uh, Harris goes, I think that this is a great choice for her. A lot of what you were saying here, too, because, it, and Clark, you brought up all the movies that she had been in the past, but now people are really talking about her because of what she did and the acting chops that she showed in Moonlight. By putting yourself in a spotlight like this, it is a smart career choice for an actor or an actress to do something like this because I want to get past the days of the Sam Worthington, Jai Courtney, um, you know, Taylor Kitsch shoving it in your face. That's your next movie star. Do it right. The reason Tom Cruise is a movie star is because he took smaller little roles, built himself up, peppered himself in there, and you said, oh, that's someone to watch. That's someone to watch. If she does things like this and she starts putting herself, that's how you build the reputation 
communication with the audience by showing that you can do something like Moonlight and then you're in a silly big dumb action movie like Rampage but you still brought gravitas <laughs> to it because you have those kind of chops. We remember that kind of stuff and that way when you do another smaller one, oh, maybe people who didn't see Moonlight, that's the girl from Rampage. And then <laughs> there's people who have seen, people who've seen Oscar movies that, that go, oh, I got dragged out to see Rampage. It's the girl from Moonlight. It adds something to it. So I think it's a very smart move that she's doing this. We also saw uh, after Brie Larson won the Oscar, right. yeah. Captain Marvel was basically yep. the first thing that was announced. One I'm for me, one for them. Exactly. Yeah. And I think it's, it's exactly what you're saying. And I'm glad that she's sort of following suit. I would like to uh, clarify that I was saying Assassin's Creed. I was using it as the spearhead to the 20 years of garbage oh, predating. I, 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 I'm with you. I, I agree. It, it, it has been in a crap heap lately. But I just this is this, you think this one. Is it? Well, it, it doesn't really. There's, it's not following suit to anything. So there's, there's no there's no storyline that we're so we hope we, they can pull it off. That yeah. is the advantageous thing. They do have the freedom to build a story yeah. around the destruction, or whatever sure. way they want yeah. to do. Now it would be we'd be uh, remnant not to point out the fact that talking about 20 years of garbage uh, video game movies, the one video game movie that most people seem to agree is the one watchable and good one that we all have guilty pleasure for is, of course, Mortal Kombat! <laughs> and uh, Clark over here had the director of Mortal Kombat, Paul W.S. Anderson, on Nightmares yesterday. It's online right now. Make sure you go and check that out. All right, guys, well, it is Thursday, which means it's time for us Love to talk that. about what is opening this week, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. we got three major films opening this week. Number one, speaking of Paul W. Sanderson, Resident Evil, the final chapter is opening up. Uh, and so, Natasha, tell us about these movies, starting with that one. All right. Picking up immediately after the events in Resident Evil Retribution, Alice, played by Mila Jovovich, is the only survivor of what was meant to be humanity's final stand against the undead. Now she must return to where the nightmare began, the hive in Raccoon City, where the Umbrella Corporation is gathering its forces for a final strike against the only remaining survivors of the apocalypse. A Dog's Purpose is also coming out this week. Reincarnated, reincarnated as multiple canines over the course of five decades, a devoted dog voiced by Josh Gad develops an unbreakable bond with a kindred spirit named Ethan, played by Bryce Geisar. As the boy grows older and comes to a crossroad, the dog once again comes back into his life to remind him of his true self. And we also have gold coming out. Kenny Wells, a prospector desperate for a lucky break, teams up with a similarly eager geologist and sets off on an amazing journey to find gold in the uncharted jungle of Indonesia. Getting the gold was hard, but keeping it is even more difficult, sparking an adventure through the most powerful boardrooms of Wall Street. Uh, the one uh, myself that I'm really looking forward to, and I've been looking forward to this one for a while, is gold. Uh, just the story sounds great. Then you get a guy like Matthew McConaughey in there. That sounds great. D like, and you know, I I gotta admit, I haven't been looking forward to a dog's purpose, even before you know the controversy of the video and all. I wasn't looking forward to it, not because I didn't think it looked good, but I'm a dog guy. Mm -hmm. I have uh, owned dogs my whole life. I don't want to go watch a movie where one character dog dies nine times. I just didn't want to see it, and that kind of turned me off. But the one I'm, I'm particularly looking forward to is gold. What about you, John? <laughs> uh, well, it's a, for me, it's a pretty dry one. I, I'll. Looking forward to is strong. Um, I'm looking forward to possibly watching some more Star Trek The Next Generation this weekend. But for, <laughs> for the reviews, uh, I, I think it's time to lay Resident Evil to rest. So I'm going to I'm going to take it. I'm going to dig a hole. I'm going to put Resident Evil in it. I'm going to bury it. And I'm going to say, please don't come back. And I'm going to walk <laughs> away. Dog's purpose, um, I can't look. I have same reason. Because my dog Gypsy's been sick for like three weeks. I don't need to see someone's dog die seven times. At a point in my life, I'm happy enough where I'm like, I have nothing to be sad about. I'll watch A Dog's Purpose to bring me back to reality and to flog myself, uh, <laughs> cinematically speaking. But, I mean, really, Star Trek TNG, folks, it's awesome, but we're going to lay Resident Evil to rest. Clark. Yeah, um, we had Paul on Nightmares, as you mentioned, and um, I look, my dad took me to see not only Mortal Kombat in the theater, but uh, Resident Evil as well. And wow. um, Paul had mentioned that, you know, when they first started this, he had had all these little ideas in his head that he had sort of put in, filed away for if we should happen to get another one or another one. And now, however many movies in, those things are finally coming out. And I like the idea of Alice going back to where it all began. So I'm, I'm looking forward to Resident Evil. I, I have fun with Paul's movies, so I'm excited. I'm surprised because someone keeps telling me about this over and over, and I said, I don't know if I want to see it. And they said, you should. And I said, okay, so I'm going to watch the Royal Rumble this weekend. It's, uh, <laughs> it's on the WWE <laughs> Network. Uh, nothing, listen, I, I, I actually, it was funny because I missed... 
the the screening, a couple of these screenings of both Gold and Dogs Progress, and I wound up seeing both of them. And I will tell you that Gold is not good. Uh, is not good. It, it, the the problem. Oh, you're crushing me. Sorry, man. It's not good. The problem. It's it's they have it. It takes place in the in the 80s. It's it's loosely based off a true story. You don't know why. There's a goofy tooth involved. It, it's uh, it, it's it's just. It, I don't understand why McConaughey did that to himself for this movie, and yeah, it, it's just a mess. And Dog's Purpose, sad. Yes, you know it's going to be with the premise alone. There's a couple. Take the controversy out of it. When I saw the trailer, I was saying. Do I want my do, do I want my daughter to see this? And it's like, no, I don't. Want to, it's not for kids. Like, she's not ready for those themes and stuff yet. It's not. No, it's not tragic. It's just part of life. But right. still, as a yeah. dog, do I want to put myself through that? <laughs> um, and then plus all the controversy. So, like I said. Watch other things on TV. You know, weekends like this, we reviewers of YouTube, we call it going to work. Yep, that's, that's so true. <laughs> well, that should have to happen once a year. Yeah. No. Oh. no. I want to play. <laughs> All right, guys, we reached that part of the show now for Buy or Sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Natasha's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell. So, Natasha, what's up? The Hollywood Reporter reports that Sean Levy and his 21 Laps banner are jumping back into the sci-fi drama genre after Arrival's Oscar nominations. The outlet reports that Fox 2000 has preemptively picked up In Constant Moon, a short story written by Larry Niven, the author behind the sci-fi classic Ringworld. James Ponzel will direct the movie about a couple about to break up during an apocalyptic level di natural disaster that might <laughs> end up, that's a tongue twister, might end up the world at sunrise. No release date has been set. Jeremy Byers saw the Inconstant Moon movie with the end of the tour's James Ponsolt directing. I, I don't know that story. Um, glad you went to me first. Uh, <laughs> Who's that character? Yeah, like, I don't know that story. Yeah, uh, uh, Sci-fi. Like I said, Star Trek The Next Generation's great, folks. So uh, sure, I, I'll buy it, I guess. I'm so glad you went to me first, Natasha. Um, You're welcome. But uh, you sure, uh, buy it. What do you think, John? Buy? I, yeah, I, I think this sounds great. First of all, I'm a big fan of end-of-the-world kind of movies. Because right. for not, not really? just for the it's big not a little too real, right? Now for you, John. Yeah. <laughs> not really because of the big explosions or whatever, because sometimes there are some really cool, smart, end of the world movies that aren't so much concerned about the uh, blockbuster aspect of it, but about what do people do if, if that's what's There's one I'm thinking right now, and I cannot remember the title of it. They don't tell you why, but the world's going to like end at midnight. But it is, I don't think it's ever said why in the movie, but everybody knows the world ends at midnight, and it just follows these characters around about what they do in that. The concept of the world's about to end, and there's a couple that decides to break up before the world ends. To me, that sounds at least intriguing. We don't know a lot, but just based on what we have, I'm going to give it a buy. I'm going to give it a big buy. I, I always encourage original or sci-fi movies. It's based off a book, obviously, but I mean, we don't, a lot of us don't know it. It's lesser known. <laughs> I would like to see something like that. What was the movie that Steve Carell was in? Is that the one? Yeah, you know with um, we, looking we, for a partner at the end of the world. Some, or something yeah, so like it, that. looking for a friend. Or right, something. right, right. I mean, it reminds me of, of something like that. But I, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by the idea of this movie. It, it's we're just repeating ourselves. It's the same thing. Like you know, a, a trailer could come out, and we're like, well, that tone looks dumb. Mm -hmm. But I like the idea of it, and I always encourage brand new sci-fi. Clark? Yeah, um, so Sean Levy and Dan Cohen are obviously producers on uh, Stranger Things. Right. And, uh, and, and I think that they have a, a really fun, interesting track record. And I believe I read that the, the um, proposed screenwriter of this worked on 10 Cloverfield Lane. Right. So I think that's also, uh, you know, a good sign. And um, so I think it's a great idea. And I like, I like that these guys are getting into um, human... Uh, science fiction stories because I think that mm. that's really what we're all excited about in in you know human stories in extraordinary circumstances and I think these guys based on what they have done lately great track record so I buy it all right what's next original Sicario writer Taylor Sheridan sat down with Collider Zone Adam Chitwood at the Sundance Film Festival to talk about his latest movie in contention there Wind River the conversation soon turned to Sheridan's upcoming work on the Sicario sequel titled Soldado which is now filming with Benicio Del Toro and Josh Brolin both returning speaking on how the sequel came to be Sheridan revealed some plot details about the new movie 
Look, you can't really do a sequel, but I sure would love to see what happened if these guys didn't have a chaperone. Because basically, they're operating within the United States, so I played with some actual laws that exist and found a way that they could operate more or less legally within the U.S., but they had a chaperone. What happens if they weren't in the U.S. and they didn't have a chaperone? Christian, buyers sell the new plot details for Soldado. <laughs> I love that. That is amazing. <laughs> bye, 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 bye. That is such a great, great story because I love Benicio del Toro in this movie. An unleashed Benicio yeah. del Toro and an unleashed Josh Brolin. This dude, the writer, man, he really locked it down. And I'll be honest, and I think we were even on Movie Talk when they announced they were going to do a second one and they weren't bringing back, um, uh, help me out. The, Villeneuve. Yes, well, and Deacons, I think. Both, both of them, they're not, they're not bringing them back because the look of that film was what I love so much about it, but I really love the writing of it. And he's locked in. He's not just doing this because it's not that movie made gangbusters at the box office. It did well, but it, he's locked into this story. And it is so intriguing to hear what they're going to do. It's going to be full fledged. Just go for it. it, it it's going to be tough to watch. We know that. But I, I'm on board, man. That was great. Clark? Um, it's a cautious buy for me, I think. I liked Sicario, I enjoyed it. Um, I still don't really know if we need another one I or need to continue with those characters but I think it could be interesting to see like you were saying Christian the these two guys unleashed I wonder I, I would be curious to see what their conflict is because I think that's what made Sicario so interesting was the mm. chaperone you know you have to work within these boundaries and so and so it, hopefully they find a way to give them something where there is conflict where they may have to rein it in or we watch them go too far or whatever it is so I cautiously buy Jeremy yeah I buy it too because like, like Christian was saying that's an interesting thing you know in the first one you have the dogs on the leash the second one just unleash them and watch what happens that's that's super intriguing to me I don't want it to be a US Marshals scenario right. or law Lost World by Michael Crichton. If you read the book, you can tell they were like, you need to write another Jurassic Park because you need to, you know? Right. So I hope there's genuine inspiration and he really took the characters where he felt the characters needed to go and where the people will like to see them go. Maybe they'll see them go and not necessarily like to see them go, but be intrigued that they go there. So it's a buy for me, but I hope it's for the right reasons. I'm going to, like Clark, I'm going to cautiously buy this. The only reason I'm not going over the moon about it getting really excited is because some of the key filmmakers behind the first one, as you point out, are not there for this one. That can be very... Different. Sure. It, it can work. We've seen it work before, but I am like the fact Deacon's not there and all that kind of stuff. I am a little bit nervous about that, but I'm going to keep a positive mind frame and say I'm going to buy it. All right, guys, listen, we do this show live, and since we do it live, we like to save a little bit of time at the end of the show to take some of your live Twitter questions. You can start sending those in right now, and Wendy will pick a couple out near the end of the show. Just make sure you're following us on Twitter at Collider Video and send those questions on in. We'll get to them near the end. I also want to mention that a little bit later today, Jedi Council with this man, Christian Harloff, is going to be up on the Collider Video channel, so check out that later. Also, uh, tomorrow, a brand new match between Mark Yodi Riley and the glorious one, Sam Levine, is going to be up. And of course, don't forget, the team match just went up, I believe it went online two days ago? It went on Tuesday, yeah. Tuesdays, ETC versus Team Tough Beats. Make sure you check that out. And of course, this past Friday, the newest episode of Jeremy Johns' show, Awesome Tacular with Jeremy Johns, went online. So make sure you go and check that out as well. Well, listen, guys, we've got a little mailbag that you guys can write us to. Make sure you're following us all the time, subscribing to our YouTube channel, but you can also email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. If you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address, just send mail there. Maybe you'll see it here on Movie Talk Monday through Friday. Maybe Maybe you'll get a chance to see it on the mailbag show on Saturday and Sunday. But for now, Natasha, what is in the mailbag? Diane writes, you guys are the best and so glad I have a show to watch every day. Okay, that said, with Tom Cruise on the short list for Green Lantern and once considered for Iron Man, what superhero would you want Tom Cruise to play? Jeremy. I got this. I got this. This is the answer, by the way. We're asking a man who is made famous from running. What superhero would he play? He would be the Flash, folks. He wouldn't even put up with all those rewrites. <laughs> he would write it himself with his mind as he as he spewed the words from his mouth to the paper, and it went on the paper because he has superpowers himself. He would be the Flash. He would run if he's not actually the Barry Allen Flash. He might be able to be Jay Garrick, although he looks young enough to possibly be slightly, slightly older Barry Allen Flash. 
Christian, if you had to put Tom Cruise in as a hero, which one are you going to do? I'm not doing it. I refuse. <laughs> he <laughs> runs for I, a living. I refuse to do it because he remember he was supposed to play Tony Stark at one point. Yes, uh, he was a long That's time right. ago, and he just. The, and it's not that I don't love Tom Cruise. I do. And I think that as an action star, he's great. But I think Tom Cruise is one of those guys, one of those actors, that at this point, it's hard to not see Tom Cruise. And with especially, I wouldn't put him anywhere near the DC universe. The DC universe needs to find uh, people that are lesser known to really, so you, you engage them as that character. And Tom Cruise isn't there. I don't think he fits into the Marvel universe. If there's some kind of smaller... It, Schnepp would be the guy to ask because he probably knows some perfect character of some unknown <laughs> comic book that I've never heard of. And I go, oh, yeah, that's great. That should be great for him. But out of the ones I know, I wouldn't put him in any. It's, it's a little bit challenging, too, because you're talking about starting a new character. Uh, because, look, no studio wants to start a new character that they can't lock in a six-film deal with and have them play that character for, like, ten years. Tom Cruise is approaching 55 years old, so that's challenging. But what is the physical thing about Tom Cruise that he that we all know. He's Runs. short. Yeah. Well, he is short. short. <laughs> Wolverine! <laughs> if no. he's supposed to be short, make him a new Wolverine. You buy, you buy Put on the, of course I don't. But whatever. <laughs> he's short. He fits the mold, so go with Wolverine. I don't know, Clark. Uh, I, I uh, Similar to Christian, w he, none. He does not need to be a superhero because he's a human superhero. I think that's what makes us love Tom Cruise as an action star is that he's a guy. You know what I mean? And yes, he's a movie star and yes, he has that thing about him, but for a movie star, he plays an everyman most of the time and then accelerates as an everyman. And so I don't think he needs superpowers. I think he just is a, a, a man-made superhero in and of itself. So no, I don't, I don't want him to be a superhero. Can we, in the world of really talented editing and fans and effects out there, can we take a montage of him running on YouTube and add like the lightning from like the, <laughs> the flash, flash lightning, lightning just to see what it looks like. <laughs> Someone out there, I feel like you could do it if you do it. I love you forever. He might actually already be playing a version of a superhero because in The Mummy, we don't know who yeah, he's playing. That's true. Well, he comes back from the dead, apparently, so you're right. Maybe he's like some kind of superpowered being now. All right, what's next? Jimmy writes, with the third standalone Star Wars film yet to be announced officially, would you guys be cool with a Star Wars standalone set in the prequel era? If so, what story would you want it to focus? Thanks for answering, and bring the filthy, ya bunch of filthy animals. No, Christian. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that oh. I, the pre prequel era, the prequel era was set up wonderfully. It was set, it was set up nice. The stories alone in the prequel era, stuff they did in the Clone Wars, stuff they've done in the comics, in the books. Absolutely. As far as what story, I'd like to see something with Sifo Diaz as far as how, you know, maybe the mission that he was on in between Phantom Menace and Clone Wars. I think there's stuff you could do leading up to it. There's stuff that they're working on in the Marvel comic right now, stuff that Yoda did before uh, Phantom Menace. There's a, there are tons of stories and great stories, and I'd like to see what the prequel era looks in somebody, in somebody else's uh, director's eye. I'd love to see that and I also wanted to see a flashback in Ryan I'd love to see Ryan Johnson's version of the Clone Wars yeah I, I think it's an absolute something they should do eventually so let me let me put this to you though you have three choices you can either have one an old Republic era movie yeah two a current or fur furthering down the road movie or a prequel era. I movie. would take the first two choices you you put. So up it there would first. come in last place for you. It would put in last place, but this is remember as f what is Bob Iger's talking about as far as once a year for the foreseeable future. Eventually, there's go they're gonna ha there's so much to explore. I think it would be I, I think it'd be a crime honestly to not go back and see. I'd love to see from somebody else's eyes like a Matthew Vaughn prequel era movie. That'd be great. What do you think, Clark? Uh, does Ewan McGregor as Obi Wan count? Kind of. Mm. Isn't that I, the I, prequels? It, it well, but it's the in problem between is both saying, movies. Now we're going we're much further. We're getting Little closer to the uh, to the stuff now. They're yeah. saying during the prequels. So you and McGregor's Obi Wan. The movies that they're talking about would probably that they have been kind of rumored would happen after Episode Three. So it wouldn't technically oh, be. Oh, fair enough. Okay, then um, no. <laughs> She's straight up like, well, then, no, screw that noise. Um, I, I agree with Christian. I really do. I think that the prequels, the world building of the prequels was fine. The execution was horrible, but George Lucas had a neat vision that he just, he couldn't, he couldn't make work, but I think someone else in the seat could make a chapter in that world work. I'd like to see something with the Clone Wars, although the Clone Wars animation filled in a lot of that. I would like to see a story where after Order 66, everyone gets wiped out, but this Jedi survives. Because there's that scene where Obi-Wan survives and kind of crawls out of the water, and that's it. You never see anything. What if 
they're I, like he's isolated. Someone's isolated on this planet. His entire like his Jedi crew's been wiped out, and he has to evade these people who were friends of his like a second ago. You know, and like where do, what does that do to him? You know, that would be an interesting thing too. Well, they could make the movie, they can make the universe a lot larger too because they don't have to uh, whether it's Obi Wan or other characters too because of what you said with the Clone Wars series. They built up like Chom Sudalo was introduced mm-hmm. there. Uh, Saw Gerrera was introduced there. There Ahsoka was introduced there. There's so many new characters that were introduced in that era that you would have to use any of those. You could build it. This it's such a big universe. I feel like this has the opportunity to reach across the table and have all Star Wars fans with the prequel and current movies shake hands and go, Oh, you know what? The prequels aren't yep. so bad, you know? So it's a good it's an advantageous opportunity if someone wants to take it on. All right, guys, I said we'd save some time to get to your live Twitter questions, and we're going to do that right now. Wendy, what have you picked out? The first one comes from Christopher Kokorin, who writes, Could WB's meddling in DC potentially damage its relationships with filmmakers in other movies? Look, here's, here's the thing. Every studio gets involved with their movies. It happens with every movie. It just does. And when the movie's great, it's called a great collaborative effort. It was a team effort, you know, from stu- from the studio on down. Uh, listen to Peter Jackson talk about how heavily involved the studio was with The Lord of the Rings. And he loved it. He loved that interact action, all that kind of stuff. Joss Whedon, at least for the first Avengers, loved the interaction with, with their bosses. The Marvel films themselves. What do you think Kevin Feige's doing? Kevin Feige is meddling, except when the movies work, we don't call it meddling, we call it teamwork. <laughs> when the movies don't work, then we call it meddling. It, it does the stories we start to hear, so I, we start to hear coming out of Warner Brothers about too many cooks in the kitchen. That's been the main complaint at this point. And I feel like when the stakes get higher, this is true in Hollywood, this is true in finance, this is true in almost any industry you work in. When what you do starts to get bigger, have the bigger budgets to get the more attention, more people want to get involved. I'll tell you a little, a little story. Back in the days when this whole operation was AMC, and we loved working with AMC, they were great partners. They weren't, they never meddled. It was partnering. They always worked great with us. And we were this little group, because AMC is headquartered in Kansas, and we were this little group out in Burbank, and nobody at AMC knew what we were doing or cared, except our immediate bosses, who were wonderful to work with. But as the AMC channel started to get like millions of views a month and more and more attention were being paid to it. And we became you know, a little bit from us. All of a sudden, there were other executives at AMC that started having ideas who never even knew we existed before. Mm-hmm. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily a good thing. It's just that's life. That happens in a lot of things. But I think at the core, the problem is not Warner Brothers getting involved with the films. The core is that they're letting too many people get involved with the films. Whereas in a situation like Marvel, you got one corporate guy, and that's Kevin Feige, who directly gets involved, and, and that's kind of it. I just think they need to limit how many hands get in this pot. What do you think? Well, as far as, you know, is it going to make directors or other talent kind of go, mm, I don't know if I want to get involved. It's a different situation. I mean, there's some directors that maybe know, maybe there's friends of, uh, let's say Patty Jenkins and has has a terrible, this is all speculation, let's say, let's say she has a terrible... Hypothetical, not speculation. Uh, that she yeah. has a terrible experience on Wonder Woman, right? And then she goes and she tells someone else that I didn't have a great time, and it was one of her friends. And her friend is J.J. Abrams. And then they go after J.J. Abrams. I don't know. I didn't really like the uh, the experiences that Patty told me, so I'm going to stay away. That's certainly possible. It absolutely happens. The other possibility is thinking of another sports analogy. LeBron James. When did he really hit his stride when he won those championships for Miami or when he brought it back to Cleveland. He took a a, a city that had not had a championship. There's a director out there going, DC's not working, but if I'm the the lady to do it or if I'm the guy to do it, they're going to be like, oh, Patty Jenkins, Wonder Woman, that's the one to turn DC around. So, And remember, it's also, it's a job. It is a job. So you got a job with the big studio saying, hey, come work with us. It might be like, "Uh uh-oh. It depends on, on clout of the director, too. There's certain directors that can go... Leave me alone for a little bit. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to do this. Like look at what Nolan did with Batman Begins. He was able to do that. And he was able to do it more with Dark Knight, obviously. But there are ways around it, and there's 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 positives and negatives for both sides. 
Jeremy? Yeah, it's all about uh, what works for. I'm glad you brought up the individual, like, oh, there's some directors that works for this, some directors work that way. It all, it all comes down to how it works for the directors, studios, actors, writers, producers. Like, it, no two houses are going to be the same. I don't have any sports analogies, but I do have Star Trek The Next Generation, folks. <laughs> James T. Kirk ran his enterprise different than Jean-Luc Picard did, and it worked for both, and it was completely different. Sometimes the meddling works, sometimes the meddling does it, and it doesn't, and if it causes a problem, someone needs to fix something. Uh, but some of the greatest stuff you've ever seen and enjoyed came from studio meddling. So uh, whether it's a problem, that's all a subjective thing per the house. Clark? Yeah, well, I think the interesting situation for Warner Brothers is, and they've said it many, many, many times, we are the studio that uh, is all about the director. That's what yeah. they, that's their mantra. That's what they are putting out into the world. And so when you have these situations where directors are leaving, um, you know, I don't think that that necessarily correlates with what they're trying to put out into the world. But on the other hand, you can look at directors like James Wan. James Wan has made a ton of money for Warner Brothers. Yep. And that's I think by all accounts, he maybe didn't have the best experience with Universal on Fast 7 or Furious 7. And so he comes back over to WB and they say, look, you've made us a hell of a lot of money with your Conjuring movies. And now he gets Aquaman. So I think it just depends on it depends on the filmmaker. Yeah. In, in some cases, yes, they do adhere to their we are a director first studio. But in other cases, maybe not. You know, Fox, you could, that's a great analogy because Fox in the same way, you know, when you got a guy like Brian Singer, who's made them tons of money, they kind of let him do, for the most part, they kind of let him do his thing. When they were doing Fantastic Four and had Josh Trank, who had only done one small movie, they were a lot more right. hands-on. So Gavin Hood. Yeah. Gavin Hood as well. Yeah. So yeah, it really does depend from situation to situation. All right, what's next? Phil Fang Foom writes, if you weren't a oh, movie Phil. reviewer, what do you think your alternative career would have been? <laughs> but, I, I would absolutely be in sports talk. I would absolutely be in, in sports talk radio, ESPN or something like that. That's what I would be doing. <laughs> I'd, uh, I'd still be a projectionist at the movie theater waiting for my dare to be great situation. <laughs> what about you, Clark? <laughs> uh, this will probably surprise no one. I would be a film professor in college. Probably would have stuck with stand-up comedy. My wife wouldn't have liked it, but we're talking about a different <laughs> universe here. All right, last question of the day. All right, this one comes from Ethan Kenestra, who writes, What Star Wars characters would you like to see from the TV shows or novel in movies? Ahsoka Tano. Well, I'm out. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, uh, if you knew this character, I guarantee it would be your choice, and it's Ray Sloan. She is, um, yeah. she is someone that has been, she's a strong character who is on the side of the Empire, who has made it, what I like of what the books have done was show more of the human side of the Empire, and she's also one of those that she's trying to build up. She's been there during the height of the Empire. She has been there during the downfall. Um, there's a lot happening with Ray Sloan that I think she's going to show up somewhere. Now, whether that's in Rebels or in the films, I think we're going to see Ray, Ray Sloan because the fans are responding to her. I'm just going to agree with you. What about you, Jeremy? Uh, um, well, if we're talking current canon, uh, Grand Admiral Thrawn, no idea how you would do it or how they would they would. Do it, but if you're just throwing, hey Jeremy, throw out a name, Grand Admiral Thrawn. I've wanted to see that guy for decades. All right, guys, so that'll do it for this installment of Movie Talk. Thanks so much for joining us. Don't forget, jump down to the comments section and leave your thoughts and opinions on all the topics that we discussed here today. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. First, starting way over there, Miss Clark Wolf. Clark, where can people find you online? Thank you for having me today, John. You can find me on Collider Nightmares every Wednesday at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Check out uh, Paul Thomas, or huh, I knew I was going to do that. Paul W.S. Anderson <laughs> uh, joined our panel. He did the whole show with us, so it was lots and lots of fun. We talked about Mortal Kombat, Soldier, AVP, Resident Evil, all the good things. So check it out. It's up on Collider Video now, and you can find me at Clark Wolf, Clark with an E, Wolf with an E. Mr. Jeremy Johns. No one blames you. There's a lot of Andersons in the film biz. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. Uh, you can find me at Jeremy Johns on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter, at Real Jeremy Johns on Facebook. You can find me with my new show, Awesome Tacular, on the Verizon Go90 network, where we do all sorts of craziness and fun stuff. We're, we're, we're cooking up a new pot here. We're, 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 <laughs> we're, we're doing some funsies, and you'll like what we got. Mr. Christian Harloff. Uh, yeah, check out Awesome Tacular, too, because there's going to be some cool, cool Star Wars stuff on that show also. But you can find me on Jedi Council. Uh, every Thursday, including today, and the movie trivia showdown. We're going to have the continuation of the third round with ETC and Tough Beats. That's going to happen tomorrow and right afterwards. Riley versus Levine. Big, huge match. A lot of stakes. Check it out. 
Sitting over there, of course, we've got Natasha Martinez. Natasha, where can people find you? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at NatashaLexis underscore. And, of course, Wendy Lee. You can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And you guys can simply follow me on social media, on Twitter and on Facebook, just at John Canby. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us, and until next time, bye-bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.